hello from my daily walk, something which has become part of our daily life for many of us in lockdown. It's a beautiful day out here in the fields surrounding Letchworth Garden City and the up close and personal event that I'd like us to explore together today also took place on a walk. This time on a walk from the city of Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus on the very first Easter Sunday afternoon. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village called Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked about those things, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but God kept them from recognising him. Jesus asked them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stood still and their faces were sad. One of them was named Clopas. He said to Jesus, Are you the only person visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know? Don't you know about the things that have happened there in the last few days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. He was powerful in what he said and did in the sight of God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed Jesus over to be sentenced to death. They nailed him on a cross, but we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Also, it is the third day since all this has happened. Some of our women amazed us too, early this morning. They went to the tomb, but they didn't find his body. So they came and told us what they had seen. They saw angels who said Jesus was alive. Then some of our friends went to the tomb. They saw it empty, just as the women had said. They didn't see Jesus' body there. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. How long it takes you to believe all the prophets have said. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer those things and then receive his glory? Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures. He began with Moses and all the prophets. They approached the village where they were going. Jesus kept walking as if he was going to go further but they tried hard to keep him from leaving. They said, Stay with us, it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. He joined them at the table. Then he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognised him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, He explained to us what the scriptures meant. Didn't our hearts feel as if they were on fire as he talked with us on the road? I absolutely love that incident. It's one of my favourites in the whole Bible and it makes me smile every time I read it. It's such a lovely event. And it's an important one too, because it's one of the reports we have of Jesus being up close and personal with people after he died and came alive again. And those reports so carefully and methodically compiled for us by, from eyewitnesses stack up as fantastically strong evidence that it was absolutely true that Jesus died and came alive again. And I think those are really important for us to hold on to. And I love it too because of what we learn about Jesus. Because if I were Jesus after all that he'd been through, I definitely would have appeared in the city centre or maybe in front of uh, the high priests. Uh, look, all that you've thrown at me and look, here I am having conquered death. Here I am alive again. Um, the kind of first century equivalent of a big showy press conference. And certainly if I were Jesus' PR assistant, I would have suggested exactly something like that. But Jesus doesn't choose to do that. Instead, he chooses time after time to be up close and personal with people in their every day, on a beach over breakfast, in a garden, in a locked room, and here today on a walk from Jerusalem back home.
Now there are loads and loads of different things that you can pull out of that incident. But I've been captivated this week by just one line I discovered in a book when I was reading around the text. And the line contained the idea that it's possible to view that journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus as a picture of the journey we all go on towards faith. It starts with questions and wondering and thinking about things. And then at some point, God himself, Jesus himself in the original incident, makes himself known. And from that encounter, lives are changed. And I'd like to encourage you today, if you are on a journey like that for the very first time of thinking and asking questions and exploring the possibility that God is real and God is for you, then that's a precious, precious journey to be on. And I'd like to encourage you too that it's our belief and our experience that at some stage, God for you too will come, make himself present make himself real, make himself known. But I've started to think that rather than just being a picture of that journey we go on for the first time towards faith, we actually go on journeys like that multiple times in our Christian lives. Lots and lots of times and for all sorts of different reasons. It seems to me that that journey for those first disciples had three phases. The first phase is a deeply uncomfortable one. For Cleopas, and people think the second disciple was actually his wife Mary, everything had been turned upside down. If it was Mary who was the second disciple on the Emmaus Road, then John tells us she was present at the crucifixion. What a traumatic thing to have experienced. And for both of them, their whole understanding of things has changed completely. They believe Jesus was going to lead some kind of military coup and redeem and release Israel from uh, the oppressors, the Roman army, which um, held its people captive. And of course, Jesus didn't do that in the way that they'd hoped and anticipated. So there they were, finding themselves on the Emmaus Road with all sorts of questions. And the word that actually is used um, in the Bible text, our English one translates it as um, talking about things. The original one is much stronger. It, sen it has the sense of um, a strong debate, a debate with fire in it, and there's an anger about it, that emotions are raised in this debate. And in this first phase of the journey, we can often feel really upset, unsettled, it's uncomfortable. But for us, just as for Clopas and maybe Mary, there comes a point when God makes himself known. And although we cannot see Jesus in the flesh, we have experiences of God making himself real to us. I'm always struck by the things that Jesus had to say in the run up to his arrest and crucifixion. And there's a bit in John 16 where he says to the disciples, it's actually better for you that I go away. What can possibly be better than having Jesus right there with you, flesh and blood Jesus that you can interact with, you can see, you can ask questions, you can hear him speak to you. Well, according to Jesus, the better thing is actually the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7, but what I'm about to tell you is true, Jesus said. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor, the friend, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The fantastic truth that we experience is that God makes himself known to us through the Holy Spirit. And through those encounters, we are always changed and we always have the choice to act on that change.
And those journeys can have all sorts of starting points. I can clearly remember a time in my 20s when I'd slipped into all sorts of things which um, are difficult to think about now, especially as I was nominally a Christian and I felt not only guilt for them, but as Richard was explaining last time, shame as well. Not that lots of people knew about it, but the shame I felt as I was observing myself and thinking back on my past was absolutely intense. And the questions I was wrestling with was, how can God accept me and how can God love me knowing what I did? And I vividly remember that time of wrestling with those thoughts. And then on one Easter, I can clearly remember the Holy Spirit just impressing on me the truth of the fact that Jesus died for all of that. And even that, which was so intensely embarrassing and shameful to me, would be forgiven, would be covered, the slate would be wiped clean because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I can just remember that intense feeling of freedom and joy that came from having that, that sort of mantle of shame lifted. Sometimes a journey can start when God wants to call us to something new. And sometimes he lets us feel uncomfortable with the now, the normal, the what we used to. And I can remember a friend, uh, a guy that I met uh, through work called John, having a story of an experience like this. And uh, when you met John, one of the first things that would have struck you about him was that he had a, a really strong speech impediment, a really profound stammer, so that when he started to form the words, it was actually quite a long time. There was a delay between him starting to form them and the words actually coming out from him from his mouth. And he had a great story about how he originally became a Christian, but that soon afterwards, God said to him clearly, you will preach. And he was just wrestling with this whole crazy idea. How can somebody <laughs> with a speech impediment like mine stand up and speak? Just absolutely nuts. Then anyway, he was out for a walk one day and again, he felt on a Sunday it was, and he felt God lead him to a church service. I'd never been to the church before. And he went and sat down uh, at the back of this crowded church. And the guy stood up to lead the service and said, well, we've had a bit of a disappointment because the speaker who we booked for today hasn't been able to make it, but God has told me that somebody is here with a message. We have a speaker here. And he paused. And my friend John knew, absolutely knew that it was him. So he got up as a new Christian and went to the front, stood up, turned around to the lectern, and as he started to speak, his stammer completely disappeared. It was absolutely amazing, and I've heard it from myself, that when he preaches, there is no stammer, and yet in normal conversation, it's very much an affliction that he has to live with. And then there are those journeys which none of us want to go on, journeys which start from a more difficult place, just like this one did for Cleopas and Mary. Journeys which start with disappointment, deep disappointment, maybe when circumstances come at us left field which we weren't expecting and turn our worlds upside down and cause us to ask, where were you, God, and what were you doing, God? Journeys which have hopes shattered, dreams destroyed, and prayers seemingly unanswered or answered with a no. And if you're on a journey like that or have been on a journey like that, I don't presume for one moment to tell you what God will do. But I will say this with confidence, that God will draw alongside you. He will make himself known to you. He will speak to you, have his purposes and his love and his care. And he will take you to a place of restoration and healing. Jerusalem to Emmaus 
is such a powerful reminder that our God isn't aloof, nor does he keep himself at a distance. Our God is a God who comes close, right into our ordinary every day. And he comes to speak and guide and explain and encourage. And when we go on journeys of our own, whether they're journeys of joyful anticipation, butterflies in the tummy excitement, or journeys through darker places, then God walks alongside us. Emmanuel, God is with us. May we learn to recognize him, hear his voice, see him along the way. And I don't think it's stretching the story too far to point out that those disciples had each other on their journeys. A physical journey from one city to another, but also a journey into a bigger awareness of God and his purposes. And if today you've become aware that you are on a journey yourself, then can I encourage you to reach out to somebody else? Maybe pick up a phone to text or email or call and just ask somebody to walk alongside you talk things through with you pray with you Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near, and I will feel no for my God is real. I can see a light that is coming 
for the heart that holds on And there will be an end to these troubles But until that day comes Still I will praise you Still I will praise you, Lord Oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go In every high, in every low In every high and every low Oh no, you never let go, Lord You never let go of me I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I'll raise a hallelujah
or whether in fact we feel we're on a mountain top. God, I thank you that wherever we are in that journey, you are right there with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And God, I thank you that you are guiding us, that you are leading us, that you are carrying us. And God, I just pray for each and every one of us now, God, that as we go into another week of the unknown, God, I just pray that each person would know your presence with them, either while they're worshipping or in conversation with one another or listening again to the word, whatever that is, God, I ask that, that we would know your presence with us. God, we love you. We worship you. We honour you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen.